3D Design for 3D Printing Tutorial 7. Today we use variables to drive our designs and create efficient variations. This video is part of a series on learning 3D design for creating custom 3D printed parts using a free Onshape account. I'll link the playlist below so you can see the previous episodes, including how to make an account and set up your units. Now let's look at how to use variables, a powerful tool in efficiency and getting more out of our model. You might have noticed on Thingiverse that some files have a link that says open in customizer. And the interface is pretty clunky, but the potential is there. We have variables that we can input and the model will regenerate with these parameters, meaning users can easily change the source CAD to suit their needs. On Thingiverse, this is underpinned by OpenSCAD, which is a type of 3D modeling where the user writes code rather than creating their object with a graphical user interface. And in OpenSCAD, we have variables and that's what we change when using Thingiverse Customizer. What you might not know is that most modern CAD packages, including Onshape, have variables inbuilt as well. In the upper right hand side, we have our variable button and when we click it, we're given this simple interface where we can set the type of variable that we have, give it a name and then a value. Just like on OpenSCAD, we can then refer to this variable elsewhere in the design, which means that whenever we double click to update it, the design will update as well. I don't use variables for every design, but here's some examples of where they came in handy. The first is my rendition of a fractal vice. And as you can see, I have six variables at the start of the document. The very first sketch that drives the whole thing was based on the large diameter variable. Therefore, a user should be able to update this value and change the overall size and scaling of the vice automatically. Another example of when I use variables is when I'm designing a simple part that has variations in size, just like these laser cut drawers I designed and made for my studio. Here we have simple variables for height, depth, width, and thickness. So here, for instance, if I wanted a narrower draw, I could put in a much smaller value and then the draw updates with the panels ready to cut for that size. And in these instances, it's far more efficient to have one design with variables than to model multiple copies of more or less the same thing. And that brings me to what we're designing as an example of variables for this tutorial. Recently, I made a video on digging out the underside of my house to set up a workshop. And in it, I set up these 45 degree slats on the wall known as French cleats. When you put a matching 45 degree cleat on the back of other objects, they can hang on the wall and that means you can easily move them around to rearrange or just to bring parts to whatever location you're working. My aim for this video is to design some accessories that go near my CNC router. Currently, all of my cutting bits are stashed away in this toolbox. As a solution, it's not too bad, but it does use up some shelving space. And there are other bits I'd like nearby, such as the fourth axis and associated tools this set of collets to suit different diameter cutting bits, as well as the tools required to change between them. If we fast forward to the holder that I ended up designing, we can see they're relatively simple using the skills shown in the earlier tutorials. Each of these parts are just simple sketches and then extrusions. But each of the parts needs its own French cleat, and these are going to be very similar for each one, just with simple variation in dimensions that we'll use variables for. As always, we start by taking measurements. And in my case, that also involves sorting all of the router bits by their external diameter. Calipers are definitely the best tool for this job. And if you don't own a set, I have a link to an inexpensive set in the description. In my case, I had quite a lot to measure. So I kept track of everything with a simplified diagram on a piece of paper. The more planning you do in this phase, the less likely you are to make mistakes and require reprints later on. Before we look at how I use variables to create these various size cleats, let's learn how they work in Onshape by working through a simple example. In Onshape, we can come up to Create and then go to Document. But for this video, like the previous ones, I'll be working on the TT Tutorials document, which is linked in the video description. I'm going to come down to the plus, click it, and then create a new part studio, which I'll then right click to rename the tab. We're going to start simple by creating a cube, but what I recommend you do first is come up and start creating your variables. For each variable, we need to give them a name. These should be something that makes sense to you, but I'd also recommend trying to keep the name concise. The first variable I'm going to make is called width, and it can remain a length, and I'll have a starting value of 50 millimeters. 
I'll then come up and make a second variable. This time I'll set it as an angle. I'm gonna call it taper and give it a value of five degrees. As we can see on the left, our feature tree starts with our two variables. They're denoted by the hash symbol and then the current value is shown as well. Let's draw our simple cube by starting a sketch, drawing on the top plane, we'll add a rectangle, make it a square by making the sides equal, and now we'll dimension and for the first time use our variable. Instead of typing in a number, we'll start by typing in hash. This will load any variables present in the document. We can either click on them to use that value or if you want, you can keep typing in the full name. We can see here that our dimension has gone to 50 millimeters, which is what the width is currently set to. And anytime we click to edit this dimension, we can see that our variable name is there instead of the actual number. Let's make this square a cube by extruding. We'll click our geometry. And then again for the depth, I'm gonna type hash and then click on width to use that value. Let's do a quick test. If we change this value from 50 millimeters, let's double it to 100. As soon as we save it, the cube updates with the new dimensions. Let's do something slightly harder by adding a fillet all around the outside of the cube. And for the radius, we're once again going to use our variable, but this time we're gonna add some maths. So let's say I want the radius to be 20% of whatever the overall width is. I can type hash width divided by five and Onshape will calculate this for me. Hit the tick to save and let's change our variable once again. We'll put it back to the original 50 and see if it stays in proportion like we would hope. And it has. So even with this simple example, we've used variables in all three of our features. So if we want to make a change, we simply edit a single value rather than having to go into these three features and edit the value three times. To use our angle variable, I'm going to do a sketch on the top surface and I'm going to draw a sketch that will become a hole that goes into the center of the cube. Once again, I'll use some maths saying that I want the width, but this time I'll divide it by three. So the hole is a third of the width of the cube. We'll finish that and then come to extrude, select our geometry, make it a hole. Let's set our depth to exactly half the cube, which is going to be width divided by two. Let's do something we haven't done in this series and tick the draft option. Now, instead of this circle being extruded straight, it's gonna angle in or out depending on the direction that we click. As this takes an angle input, let's type in hash and then select our taper variable and click the tick to use that. If we load a section view, we can see that the cutout tapers in by five degrees. And if we wanted to update this to be 10 degrees, we simply update the variable and we see the geometry changes accordingly. By using these variables, we can change quite a lot with just this one value. For instance, I can make this cube 10 times bigger and when I zoom out, we can see it's kept all of its proportions thanks to using variables throughout. As you can see, variables are quite simple to use, but still powerful. Let's see how they worked for these cleats. Here is the cleat design. It's basically this end profile. We have a simple sketch on the end that is extruded, and then we have two holes cut for mounting. To generate this, we have a range of variables. Our width variable is the overall width of the cleat. Our thickness variable, is both the thickness from front to back, as well as the vertical thickness of this section. Our offset is how far in from the edges our two mounting holes are. And then we have two variables for the size of the bolt, a smaller one that in this case, an M4 bolt will cut its own thread as it's inserted. And then a slightly larger hole where I want the M4 bolt to pass through. After creating a basic cleat, I then sketched and extruded to create the various holders. This one for the fourth access components and tools, this one to take the collets and spanners, and this simple tray to hold the various router bits. After creating these, I then knew the overall width I needed as well as an ideal offset. So to get the cleat to mount, I simply had to edit that variable. The cleat would update and everything would match for me to export an STL ready for printing. One of the bonuses is that if I wanna to switch to M5, all I need to do is up my two hole variables by a millimeter, and all of the holes through each part will update accordingly. And let's say I discover later on that this cleat is not big and strong enough. I can always come, edit the thickness, and thanks to variables, the part will update and be much beefier. Remember the advantage here is that I can change one variable and my four different parts will all update automatically rather than having to go through each of these features and do it manually. With all of the parts designed and the STLs exported, all I needed to do was print them. And some of these parts are quite large, so that took a little while. 
by printing the cleat separately to the part holder. I avoided the need for support material with the only compromise being that I had to bolt the two sides together. Load up all of the parts and then head downstairs to the workshop to see how well they fit on the French cleat. And despite them being quite short in the vertical dimension, they actually snap on quite well. With the bonus being that they're easily removable, which makes it easier to rummage through and find exactly what I need. I'm happy with how this one turned out and I'll likely design one more accessory to fill that gap to hold Allen keys and other odds and ends. And that's it, another custom solution, thanks to being able to design and 3D print my own parts. I think there's maybe one more episode left in this series and I'm gonna base it on the most frequent requests. So please head to the comments section and let me know what you'd like to see in the final tutorial. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy designing and 3D printing your own custom designs. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.